On the 6th means it's time for me to start reading. Um, I'm going to read, uh, I hate to do this, I mean I love to read, but I hate to do this, but I don't, can't read an entire story, uh, but I'm going to read the start of a story, um, and it's a story that will be coming out in Asimov's in November, December, so you can read the end of it then, um, and may I just start, um, let's see, it goes all the way here, okay, so it's called Selfless. What scares you is that you're losing control of yourselves. You need to keep them apart, crammed into their boxes. Remember when you were a kid, before you were taken? You couldn't stand your broccoli touching your mashed potatoes at dinner time. Keep those mushy carrots away from the chicken nuggets. To avoid tantrums, mother brought, bought special plates. They came with two small sections for the veggies and a big one for meat, dishwasher safe plastic, pastel lime and turquoise and a sick pink. Everything separate, all in their proper places. Mother always said, you were a trial. Your brothers thought you were weird. Your dad left when you were 13, six months after your one self was taken from you. You were Yosef back then. Now you're pretending to be Joseph Dirasek, someone who doesn't exist. Since the trouble with Paul, yourselves keep trying to push past each other, take control at inappropriate moments, husband, father, son, boss, one at a time, damn it. And then there's always the threat that the empty self will return, tormenting you with its overpowering urge to become. Or else you might turn into the hunter again. When you wake up next to Paul, you're the husband, even though he's still asleep. He's close enough that you need to meet his expectations, even unconscious ones. Roll out of bed and step into the shower. Stare up into the hot water. Let it sluice over your face. No, you can't wash away the fear of losing Paul. He's at the center of your life. Being his husband is what keeps you sane. When he's unhappy, you're miserable and the husband's heartache is seeping into all yourselves. But Paul doesn't understand about the money. Won't understand, and that makes you so angry. You're shaving when Sandra stumbles out of her room, and then you're the dad. There's something wrong with the, my humidifier, she says. Like what, not wet enough? Makes a squealy noise. Sandra takes her place at the double sink next to you, and it smells like the basement. <laughs> she rubs the cuff of her pajama sleeve across her nose. The fireproof, the fireproof fabric has princes on it. One blonde, one redhead. From some kid movie, Frozen? You miss seeing that one. Paul took her. Ask Daddy P to take a look at it. Squeeze toothpaste onto your brush. She scrunches her face in the mirror like she's trying to find herself. <laughs> you know how well that works. Why can't I ask you? Sandra is ten and is full of questions. Too many questions. Because he's home more and he knows how things work. He's good at that stuff. Stick the toothbrush into your mouth. Five degree angle to the gums. Short, tooth wide strokes. Upper, lower, inner, outer. Just like it says on the website. They say not to trust the internet, but you pick up lots of useful camouflage tips online. Adapt or be discovered, mother always says. What are you good at? Sandra asks. You stare at her reflection. I'm pretending I'm your father, you say around a mouthful of toothpastey slime. Hard work. Good one, Joseph. She ch carves a check mark in the air with her forefinger. <laughs> If you had real feelings instead of the ones you fake, you'd resent this new thing. Sandra calls you by your first name while Paul is Daddy P. In the moment, however, you're relieved that your joke, not joke, passes muster. Except she's not done with you yet. I don't want to move to the city. You watch her eyes round in the mirror. It's dirty and there's no grass. And Grandma's museum gives me nightmares, all those creepy paintings. 
nobody wants to move, you say, and, and maybe we won't have to. We'll just have to see. It had been easy when Sandra was a toddler and you and Paul were dating, but now she's 10 and you have no idea how to be her parent. That's mostly on Paul. But with the two of them set against the move, you don't know what to do. You're torn between mother's illness and your family's demands and the bills, all the damn bills. You feel that dark self stirring. It isn't the dad who wants to protect Sandra or the husband who loves Paul. There is a you who is dangerous to this life you've made. Maybe having a family isn't working anymore. Maybe you should move to the city, just you, or run away before it's too late. At least on the train, you could be the commuter. You look good, even wearing yesterday's fashion. Brioni top coat over a bespoke blue pinstripe suit, mauve button-down Tom Ford shirt, no stripes for your shirts because they clash with the ties that Paul buys for Sandra to give you at Christmas. <laughs> this isn't a difficult self to pull off because you have hardly any lines. Catch the train at Glenbrook Station and conceal yourself behind the New York Times on the way to the city. The headline on the cast-off paper on the seat next to you screams, Psycho Doc slays nurse. The Daily News has catchier stories than the Times, and the photos remind you of your favorite paintings in the museum. You're tempted to swap. Nothing like a grisly murder to distract from your problems. But the commuter reads a serious paper. Change in Stanford. 20 minutes out of the city, the train passes through New Rochelle, which is where Paul and Sandra used to live. What would life be like if you'd never met? Empty, pointless, which is why you can't let him find out. But what if the only way to keep your secret is to leave them pointless, empty? And in that moment, the commuter, never robust, is consumed by the empty self. Panic then, because that's the one self you can't bear, you can't, and, and then, to your shame, you're the hunter. Shouldn't have thought about losing Paul. Stick your knuckle into your mouth, bite hard, and fight those terrifying instincts. It's okay, you're, you're, you're probably safe. Everyone on the train still sees the commuter. You don't want to be the hunter, but he keeps stepping forward. You used to think you'd banished him altogether. After all, it had been years since you've taken anyone, but now that mother is sick. Uh, it's stress. It's the stress. Got to get him under control. Maybe he just needs to come out and look around once in a while. As long as he, as long as you don't take anyone. Besides, you, you'd be crazy to make a move on the train. You wish you were crazy that none of this was real. If you didn't have to worry about becoming the hunter, your other selves might almost be happy. You pick up the smallest detail when you hunt, the sag of a silk scarf, the untied shoelace, the honey of cheap perfume, a jiggling knee, the scrape of a cough, the hunter sees prey all around, your throat goes tight. Why not pick one to follow? Off the train, ghosting through Grand Central onto 42nd Street, a man this time. You shouldn't fall into a pattern, but, but nobody has that ammonia scent, the uncertain step. Twist around in your seat, crane to look up the aisle and down. Where are the thin lips, chewed fingernails? When the brakes squeal the train to a stop in Manhattan, you're relieved that none of the prey feels right. You find a way to cram the hunter back into his box. So, on to the museum. Snake through Grand Central to the subway and push onto the five train. Just an anonymous New Yorker, one of 8.583 million humans hiding in plain sight. Get off at 59th and walk six minutes in the autumn chill to the white limestone mansion at 600 Park, where you grew up. Where mother 
still lives on the third floor. The discreet sign to the side of the double doors reads, Welcome to the American Museum of Pulp Art. Good morning, sir. Millie, the receptionist, greets you in the lobby. Hello, Millie. She expects you to be the boss, so you are. Mother is supposed to be in charge, but she's failing. Millie is a pleasant woman in her 50s. There's gray in her curly black hair, the hint of a stoop to her shoulders. She likes to wear flowered A-line dresses and pastel cashmere cardigans. Reading glasses hang around her neck on a beaded chain. She's lasted longer than any of the others. You, you like her because she mostly leaves you alone, but you know that if she ever discovers the family secrets, she'll have to go like all the others. Go as it leave. <laughs> You're not taking her, no. A smile. Set to open today. An unnecessary question, but it's one the boss would act. Ask. Millie is polite. Of course, sir. The museum's hours, winter hours, are 10 to 3, Wednesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Any last minute for sign-ups? She hands you a coffee. <coughs> None so far. Black with a packet of Splenda. Look disappointed to keep up appearances. One of your jobs as curator is to give tours by appointment, but visitors are a nuisance, and you're in no mood to give a tour if you're going to be sitting on the hunter all day. Time to pretend you're concerned about mother. How is she? Sip your coffee. Millie offers the overnight nurse's report. Quiet now. Scan it. She'd been screaming just after midnight, but was settled by 50 milligrams of meriparidine syrup. No surprise there. <coughs> but blood in the urine at 420? Not good. Millie's watching you. She's still suffering, poor dear. Her stare nudges you to feel sorry for the old bitch. Millie expects you to be the son, but you lost sympathy for mother long ago. She deserves her pain. Mm. Actually, all your best selves are in pain because of her. I'll go see her. Thanks, Millie. Climb the stairs to the second floor, but turn right into a gallery instead of continuing to the third, the detective gallery, your refuge. On the walls hang the family's collection of leggy blondes and willowy brunettes, some startled, some sultry, a few bored. Weary heroes in fedoras reach across tables for shot glasses or pistols. Angry thugs glower in the rain. The room is crammed with oils chosen from the burnt palette of a dive bar or all the colors of midnight. The art climbs the wall like bodies piled atop one another, worked by Raphael de Soto and Mort Kunstler and H.J. Ward and all the pulp masters that had once splashed the covers of forgotten magazines like Black Mask and Ten Story Detective. In 1911, conservative paper magnate Jonathan Bulkley moved his growing family and their servants into the lavish but tasteful mansion he built on Park Avenue. Bulkley would le later join the Man Suffrage Association opposed to political suffrage for women. <laughs> and his wife would become president of the Garden Club of America. You like to imagine what they'd make of the art hanging in their former bedroom. Once there might have been blobby American Impressionist paintings of seashores and girls in white lace, Bensons and Tarbells and Hassams. A century later, here is mother's decor. So, Mr. Jonathan Bulkley, what do you think of this fine Norman Saunders piece? A gumshoe fires his gat as he ducks through a shattered window to rescue a blonde tied to a bed her red dress bunched to mid-thigh. When you were a kid, you'd sit for hours on the floor in front of this painting until you'd imagined your way into it. Usually you were the detective, finger closing on the trigger, gun jumping in your hand, heel crunching on broken glass. But sometimes the woman, lips numb against the tape across your mouth, wrists chafing against the ropes. Paul just laughed when you showed him the Saunders, but nah, that was okay. 
He didn't know how becoming characters in, this paint, in these paintings saved you from the emptiness. Sandra just scrunched her face in disgust. But she's okay with most of the detective gallery and actually likes the spaceman gallery because she says aliens and robots and monsters aren't real. Most of her nightmares come from the soldier or the monster galleries. It's almost opening time, so climb to mother's apartment. See, now you have an excuse to keep the visit short. Massive file cabinets filled with old pulp magazines spill out of the library and encroach on the landing. The air is sour with the swell, smell of foxed paper, heavy with the weight of fallen dreams. The kitchen is empty, but there are breakfast dishes on the table, a plate with a smear of yolk, half a glass of grapefruit juice. Mother sits up in bed, perched in her nest of bedding with her pale complexity complexion and wispy spiderweb hair and white nightgown. She looks like an egg. Stare at her face. Even after all this time, you can't see what's behind those eyes. How much longer does she have left? Months at least, or maybe you'll get lucky. You see no obvious signs that she's dying. She's Always been a round woman, and leukemia has yet to pinch her flesh. Maybe the wobble of red lipstick, or the cheeks powdered like donuts, tell the true story. She insists on doing her own makeup. Like you, mother trusts no one with her disguises. Still here, she says. Sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> so I see. You don't have to pretend to be anyone with her. She knows. After all, she was the one who took you, left you a jumble of hopeless unselves. Your father and your brothers had been one side of the family. You and mother were the other. The museum's collection was hers, inherited from her uncle. The money had been father's, and when he died, most of it went to Edvard and Tomas. You two got the museum. Did you tell them? She says. I asked them. She can't be bothered to understand about Paul and the family you've made together. I asked them again. She sniffs in derision and picks up the TV remote. They click and Kathy Lee is talking to a starched and relentlessly grinning man in a dark suit. The Today Show, Cryon, at the bottom of the screen, identifies him as Frank Tweeden, a televangelist. So when are you moving? Mother says, I, I don't know. Paul is pushing back hard. Sandra says the collection is creepy and gives her nightmares. Pastor Frank Tweeden is preaching happiness, but Mother isn't having any. It is creepy, she says. That's the point. If only it were creepy in the right way. Mother's uncle Grover, who you never met, had started World's Finest Publications in the 20s and had left Mother at the company and his collection when he died in 1969. Neither the business nor the art has prospered since. Readers thought their cheap thrills elsewhere, and one by one the magazines folded. Art lovers these days find the museum's illustrations either ludicrously banal or offensive, or both. In the last decade, attendance has fallen into the East River. One by one, the funders moved on. The last one, last one, Hiram Street, died in March, and his heirs aren't returning calls. The museum can't afford to open every day anymore, and so Mother has cut salaries. Your salary. Paul thinks we should sell some of the art, you say. Maybe a couple of the science fiction pieces. He looked up some of our artists online. The man is a shithead. Good for nothing but washing dishes and cleaning your toilet. She reaches across the bed for the collection of brown plastic medicine vials. Sell all the paintings you want, her voice cracks. Sell the museum. She twists the top off one and shakes a couple of pills loose. But not until after I'm dead. She gulps them dry. Aren't you supposed to take those with water? You feel your own throat tighten when she swallows. What are they? Oxy, don't know what the fuck, <laughs> she replies with eyes closed. First hit of the morning, thank you very much. 
So how are you going to pay the bill between now and the funeral? You shrug. Pastor Frank Tweeden has written a book which Kathy Lee holds up. Saved from yourself, if only. <clears throat> Maybe you're wondering how much longer I have left. She's amused. You're out of luck. I'm sticking around long enough to see you back here where you belong. You want to know the real reason I can't move my family here? It isn't the collection. It's you. She grins. You can't stand Paul, and, and he thinks you're a monster. You should take that son of a bitch. Mother changes the channel. Steve Harvey is sautéing shrimp with Pat Sajak. I doubt he'd even know what he had lost. You're at her bedside in two steps. Slap the controller from her hand onto the bed. Like you took me. She's not allowed to talk about taking. Not Paul or Sandra or anyone. Not in private, not ever. That's your deal. You asked. She presses lips together, then shrugs. You begged for it. I was 13. I didn't know. So you made a mistake, is that it? How was I supposed to know you were confused? You were my mother. I'm no one. Just an empty space that other people fill. She gives you her pitying look. Like you, my lovely boy. Pat Sajak's shrimp has turned to pinkish white, pinkish white in the pan. They cooked long enough. He adds the asparagus. <laughs> I'm tired, Mother says. It's past opening time. Go down there and do your job. And so he does. <laughs> <laughs> about a third of the way through, and a uh, guy's about to walk in the door. Nobody, these two, mom and son, don't have taken people, but they don't know why and how it works. And as he shows someone who wants to rent some paintings, he goes to the science fiction gallery and we drop all kinds of names. And he goes through the, the gallery, uh, this obnoxious guy pisses him off, the hunter emerges, and he reaches out to take the guy at the same time the guy reaches out to take him. Huh. And they both fall down like, like a spark happens, and they look at each other and they realize they're both the same thing, and the story goes on from there. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, uh, 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 January in, um, in Asimov's. I mean, uh, it'll be in uh, November, December in, in Asimov's. So. I can take a question, or you can bolt whichever you guys need to do. Oh, one other thing then, as long as you're sitting there, uh, I do have a new story, new novella coming out uh, from Subterranean Press. Come get a copy of this. In, that's what's coming in, in January. Uh, it's uh, be a book published, a very thin volume, but that's something I'm very proud of, called King of the Dogs and Queen of the Cats, a circus story set against a, rom a revolution on another planet. There you go. Okay, go. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Question. Quick question. Uh, do you pull that second person? Yes, I would. Um, hard hard one to pull off. It's about yeah, my it's my I, third second person I've ever tried. So. That was my second place. It's a, but second person reads so well, don't you think? I mean, I think I think it like, you know, it's like, you're going to have this happen to you. We're done. So, thank you.